go. Well, hey, every day is Christmas, right? Yeah. Parents always have gifts under the tree every day, right? <laughs> I'm always giving out gifts. You're always giving out gifts. Always giving out. Wow. Can I live with you? Well, you might want to ask what gifts. Oh, what gifts? Oh, like a stone and a scorpion. And a... Say they were spectacular. Right. Like, here's your meal. Oh, gosh. Well, every day is Christmas and Easter. The Bible and joy to the world and other carols. So the title really of today's message is Singing Christmas Carols with Purpose and Honesty. So as you know, the last couple of times I've taught here, uh, I try to be authentic, try to wear my heart on my sleeve and confess. I have confessions to make. Oh, wouldn't you know? <laughs> I really never thought about any of the words of the Christmas carols until I was probably in my 40s. And I had actually been a pastor of a church. I started pastoring churches when I was about 26. I was a college pastor, yeah, when I was 24. And I never thought about the words to Christmas carols. I just sang, I just sang them, sorry. <laughs> Hold on, let me move that. There we go. I just sang them without even thinking about it. Now, can I get a show of hands and feel free to be honest here? And this is a safe zone, right? Is this a safe zone here at Covenant Community Church? We're full of snowflakes. Okay, good, good. One of the things that's bigger safer is if people wear a mask. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and one of those N95s. Oh, I know, I know, totally. But... Raise your hand if some of the words we sang today, you didn't actually think about what they meant. Anyone? Yeah. I did it too. And what's crazy is my sermon is actually on those very two Christmas carols that we sang. Primarily focusing on joy to the world, but we're also going to look at the lyrics of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I was singing it, and I was singing next to that wonderful musician over there, C. Wallace, and I was singing harmony. I was like, man, this is cool. I'm singing next to a musician and getting in there, getting in the groove with harmony. And it, it was just awesome. But I, I wasn't thinking about the words. But thank the Lord, I have thought about the words since my 40s. And I have realized what they actually mean. And sometimes when we sing our songs, whether it's contemporary Christian, sometimes we even sing country music songs and we don't think about the lyrics. You know? My drunk dog, my, oh wait, not my drunk, no one sings about drunk dog, do they? That's not Peter friendly. Oh wait, anyway, I appreciate your honesty in admitting that some of the words we didn't think about. We just sing it during Christmas, right? Well, I want to read a couple of verses that should help prepare our hearts specifically for tonight. How many of you are coming tonight? Anyone? Okay, a few of you. We're going to be singing some Christmas songs tonight. And I want this message to sort of prepare our hearts for tonight as we sing these Christmas carols. When Steve first got up here, we were engaged in worship together. Steve and I were talking about how essential it is for us to worship together. For us to get together regularly to celebrate who God is. Worship is more important than anything we do. Amen? As much as I love the Dodgers, as much as I love UFC, worship is far more important. It's more important than any football game. It's more important than any baseball game. It's more important than any job. Worship is the most important thing we do. And that's why we're here. And that's why we live. So as we prepare for tonight's worship songs, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Whatever. Think about all the things you do. Gaming. Anyone do games here? Video games? Whoa. No? Wow. Anyone watch YouTube? Oh, Mariah? <laughs> right. She's like, I confess. All right. Grovel, get on your knees up here and confess. All right. What else do you do that you thought to yourself, I couldn't possibly do this to the glory of God? To the Lord. 
It says, whatever you do, do it with your whole heart. Yes, he. Oh, glorious. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, with your special person, what a wonderful thing. Weeding the garden. Weeding the garden, right? What about this? The other night, we were at uh, the tube. Is it a saloon? Yeah. Yeah. Two bit. That's true. We went to the two bit, and I actually had an IPA. Is it? Po I know. Yeah. How do you drink that to the glory of God? No. <laughs> yeah, it's. Right. Well, I'll tell you what. It's it's hard for me to eat a cinnamon roll to the glory of God because it's so delicious. And blessed Donna Ray sat one of those before me today and I ate it with butter and I was like, okay, Lord, bless this sucker and take away the calories. And he did. <laughs> All right. In the history of Israel, watch this. God was criticizing northern Israel because she was sinning. She wasn't doing things to the glory of God. She was doing it for her own self-worship and self-glory and narcissism. By the way, contrary to popular opinion, we're all born narcissists. Did you know that? We're all born selfish. And God gradually brings us into that place of where we love one another. It's really the truth, okay? And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned unto me what? Read it together with me. With her whole heart. Read it with me. With her whole heart. That's what God wants. Everything we do. And I think too often in Christianity, we're looking at stuff and going, oh, I couldn't do this to the glory of God. God's saying, do it with your whole heart. So that's what you have to ask yourself. Whatever you're doing, can I do this with my whole heart? Fair enough? Because that way you don't have Steve or me or anyone else judging you for what you do. Instead, you're constantly just asking the question, can I do this with my whole heart? Can I weed? Can I snuggle? Can I drink? Can I smoke? Can I wrap my hair? I don't have to worry about that. All these things, you ask the question. That's not being religious. That's simply asking the obvious question. Can I do this? Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of heart, as what? Say it with me. Unto Christ. Your job, if you're a barista, if you run a forklift, as unto Christ, not with eye service. In other words, we're not doing our stuff to please our bosses. Because what happens when your boss is gone? When the cat's away, the mice will play, right? Not so with God. We're not here to please our bosses. We're here to please God, which means we still work when our boss is gone. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God. Say it with me. From the heart. With good will, doing service. What? As to the Lord. Not to men. He answered, next one, said unto them, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you. In other words, God was indicting Israel through Jesus. Jesus is talking to Israel, and he's saying, Isaiah foretold of you, spoke forth about what you were going to do, you Pharisees. He says, you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but what? Their heart is far from me. And that was my life in singing Christmas carols for years. Seriously. Singing any kind of Christian songs. My heart was far from Jesus. I wasn't thinking intentionally about the song. And that's all I'm asking tonight, is when we sing these Christmas songs, don't worry about singing in tune. Not really. Sing it too. <laughs> I know. The violinist, no. <laughs> Sing in tune. No. Don't, but seriously, our, our greatest goal tonight is to think about the words that we're singing. Do we mean them? Or is it just lip service? The Lord is near to all them that call upon him. To all that call upon him, what? In truth. In other words, just be intentional. When you're talking to God, don't throw in a bunch of King James English. Half, thou doest, right? Talk to God as your daddy, as your Abba. For God is the king of the earth. 
Sing praises, what does it say? With understanding. So when we're singing our songs, sing with understanding. Think about the words. I would much rather, and this is the truth. I've been a music teacher for 16 years, and this is hard for me to say. I would rather you as my brothers and sisters in Jesus sing songs with me while I'm thinking about it too, with understanding, than singing in, in tune. Mm -hmm. If you can do both, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I would rather that. For example, do we mean the following? And if you wouldn't mind, read this with me with intention. Let's read it aloud together. I know we just sang it, but as we all admit it, I'm, I'm right there with you. I wasn't thinking about some of the words I was singing as I sang this just now. So I was being hypocritical. I was more concerned about sounding cool with Steve. But let's, let's read this together and let's just try and be super intentional and ask ourselves, do I believe that? Do I really believe it? Let's start. Here we go. You ready? Let's just read together. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all you nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come. Offspring from the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus our Emmanuel. Hail the heaven born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hallelujah. Amen. Now when you read that and you think about it, it's like, wow, that sucker was deep. <laughs> I mean, there's stuff there that's kind of hard to, you know, it's like, well, late in time, behold him come, right? Uh, offspring of incarnate deity. All that means is, God came down in a body, Jesus, and he rose and he's raised us up together with him. That's what Hark the Herald Angels Sing is all about. That's what the message of Christmas is all about and the message of Easter and the message that should be coming from every single pulpit, every sermon, every sermon should delight in what we have in Jesus and what he's done for us. Amen. Seriously, because life sucks if you don't know Jesus. <laughs> You're saying it sucks and I do know Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? We all have struggles. But man, knowing you're forgiven, knowing that Jesus dwells in you through all the crap that you go through in this life, that's what takes us through. It's what carries us through. And it's funny, I was teaching a little bit on and I'm going to read a little bit of it today on the donkey. There's purpose in that donkey that Jesus was riding, right? He's the king of kings, lord of heaven and earth. He's riding on a donkey. Actually, there's a bull of a donkey, right? Or as the archaic English says, and we talked about it the other night and <laughs> when we were having rehearsal, an ass, <laughs> right? Here's Jesus riding on the bull of a donkey, an ass, instead of a big old white horse, right? Bull of a donkey. Why? What's the purpose? All right, an exposition of joy to the world. All right, again, let's read it. Are you ready? With intention, you're probably going, dude, we just sang this. Let's do it together. Here we go. Joy to the world. Read it with me. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. 
and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, mean it, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy. Mean this, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. Do we really mean it? He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. Again, a hearty amen. amen. But we have to ask the question, do we really believe that Jesus fulfilled all these things? Right? You're saying, well, wait a minute. I know he didn't remove thorns because how many of you got a thorn this past week? Anyone? <laughs> I get thorns all the time. I live in the freaking desert. I'm walking my dogs and it's like, owie, <laughs> owie. <laughs> right? <laughs> and you say, what does that mean? Well, if Jesus fulfilled that, then what the heck is going on? Why did I just get impaled by a goat head? <laughs> right? All right. Here's another verse that unfortunately a lot of people have distorted. Or unto us a child. I'm just kidding. That's a, you remember Handel's Messiah, right? Okay. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now what a lot of people do is they put a 2,000 year gap right here. I grew up with that mentality. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, 2,000 years later, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. I disagree. I disagree with the 2,000 year gap. We're not waiting for Jesus to rule, are we? You say, well, it sure doesn't seem like it, <laughs> right? Who is Jesus governing? As Steve and I talked about, providentially, he governs the world. But spiritually, in his kingdom, he's governing our hearts. Amen? Amen. Watch. It, the passage explains it. And his name shall be called Wonderful. We're not waiting 2,000 years. We're not still waiting for Jesus to be called Wonderful. Ain't he wonderful? Amen. Right? Isn't he wonderful? Counselor. Man, who's your psychologist? <laughs> You're going, well, I know you need one, sucker. I do sometimes. But I'll tell you what. God has cured my mental ailments, <laughs> and he's still curing them sometimes. The mighty God. Do we believe Jesus is the mighty God? Amen. Amen. The everlasting Father. Do we believe Jesus is the everlasting Father? Yeah. Yes. The Prince of Peace. Is he, he's our King of Kings, and he's a Prince of Peace. We're not waiting. Is anyone still waiting for him to be the Prince of Peace? Yeah. No. Because Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. It's a different type of peace. Amen? Amen? He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's Christmas. Merry Christmas. Right? Of, watch this, I love this. I love this. We quote it all the time, every Christmas. It should be quoted more. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. We are in the new covenant. His government keeps increasing as men and women come to enter the gates of the city by belief in the gospel. Jesus said to the church, you are a city set up on a hill. Let your light so shine before people that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So God has set us as the city set up on a hill, shining brightly so that people would see our love for one another, our mercy, instead of when someone falls in the congregation and us kicking them when they're down or kicking them out of the church, we reach down and we restore them and the world looks at that and says, I want to be in that city too. Merry Christmas. Wouldn't that be great? If people started looking at our lives and saw, wow, they're merciful to people when they fall. 
They're gracious. They're loving. When they blow it, I don't care where you blow it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you blow it. We, as God's children, are called to lift each other up. Whatever it is. Now the government, whether it's conservative or liberal, they will say certain sins are worse than others. We don't do that as God's people. We don't do that. When God's people fall, we are to restore them. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Bear one another's burdens. <sighs> That's a little hint for what I'm about to talk about in just a bit. There is no cessation of the increasing of his government. It's going to keep on growing forever. That's what Isaiah pr predicted with Jesus. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. Jesus is king. To order and establish it with judgment and with justice from now on, even forever. How is this going to come to pass? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isn't that great? Can you picture God being zealous? Right? We get zealous for stuff, right? We get zealous. Oh, I'm zealous, man. I'm going to go to that game. I'm zealous because I want to watch the Steelers win or something like that with no audience, right? <laughs> That's so stupid. Oh my gosh. I don't even like watching sports anymore. It's dumb. It's dumb. I'm like, they make a touchdown. <laughs> right? UFC kicks him in the head, he falls down, he's knocked out. You can actually hear the dudes talking to each other now because there's no audience. So dumb. Anyway, I digress. Let's go to the next one. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a righteous branch. That's Jesus. And a king shall reign and prosper. That's what he's doing now. And shall execute judgment and justice. That was in Isaiah, right? He's still doing that today. He's been doing it for 2,000 years by his ascension to the throne in our hearts. Did you know that the church is the throne of Jesus? Did you know that? You say, what? <laughs> say what? <laughs> We're the throne of Jesus. The Bible says this. Are you ready? Righteousness and truth are the foundation of his throne. The Bible calls us a city of truth. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, we have become the righteousness of God. That's how he looks at us because of what he's done on the cross. He's cleansed all of our sins so that now he's made us his dwelling place, his throne. We are his throne. That's what's going on here. So he executes judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved. He saved Judah and Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And Israel shall dwell safely. What did Jesus say? When we believe on him, we go into these pastures and we're grazing safely. That's what we're all doing now. We're safe and secure. We sing it. How many ever sung the song? Leaning on the everlasting lasting arms. <laughs> Laughing arms. Sometimes I have lips. How many of you sing it? Anyone? What does it say? What's one of the lines? Safe and secure. From? Oh, well, I think it's alarm. Or yeah. yeah okay. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Safe and secure from all alarms. That's what Jesus says. Uh, God, or er, Bach. <laughs> Whoops. I almost called Bach God. I really like Bach. <laughs> Freudian slip, right? Anyway, Bach wrote a song, a piece called uh, Sheep May Graze. Remember that? And we're sheep and we're grazing in Jesus' pastures. We're totally safe and secure because of his cross. And this is his name. This is Branch. This is Jesus. Watch this. What's the one name in the Old Testament that God used for him and him alone? Yahweh. Yahweh. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Yahweh, our righteousness. Not our good works. God is our righteousness. Amen? Not our good deeds. We didn't do it. We didn't earn it. He is our righteousness. Rejoice greatly. Here's another one. This is a famous, this is the one where we talk about the donkey. We're going to talk about the ass. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout. And whenever you look in the Old Testament and see the word Zion in, in a prophetic context, where it's looking forward to what Jesus would do for us, 
The word Zion is referring to us, the church. Hebrews 12, 22 clarifies that. Okay? Just read it. Hebrews 12, 22. Whenever you see Zion in a prophetic context, it's referring to the church. And the writer of Hebrews explains that very clearly. He says, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king. Can you imagine they're all going, yeah, king, rock and roll. Comes unto you, he's just and having salvation from those wicked Babylonians and Romans. Lowly and riding upon an ass. <laughs> what a drag, <laughs> right? I mean, can you imagine being there listening to this prophecy? Jeremiah's all, yeah. And they're all, yeah, riding upon an ass and low. Dude, you suck. Put him in the dungeon. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's, that's contrary. That's why Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. What does he say? You are in the world, but not of it. We're those big aliens with the big black eyes, right? <laughs> Triangle head? Not really. We're not of this world. We're not. And I always quote the verse. I always tell people, I always ask Christians, I think I did it last time, have you been translated? Have you been translated? <laughs> He's like, uh, well, <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> you go and tell your friends, so we have this dude come to our church. He says we're all translated. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Damn, I rest my case. <laughs> right? We have been translated in the eyes of God. Jesus says the kingdom of God, when the Pharisees ask, when is the kingdom going to come? What did Jesus say? It does not come with outward show. Luke 17, 20 and 21. It doesn't come with observation. He says, for behold, what? The kingdom of God is within you. That's what it means to have Christ in your heart, folks. Took me years to understand that. I'm like, what the heck does he mean? <laughs> Lowly riding upon an ass. The Hebrew for that, this is super important. The Hebrew translation of that. Are you ready? A beast of burden. A beast of burden. What was Jesus trying to convey to us? I will be your beast of burden and I will carry your sins with me to the cross and remove them as far as the east is from the west. I will forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future. And I will give you my right. I will take your burdens because you couldn't bear them. I will take them and I will own them. So that you can live forever with me. And then it sheds so much light on Galatians 1. Brethren, if any of you is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Just as Jesus bore our burdens and took them away, he's saying, look, when you see your brother or sister fall, restore them, bear their burden, listen to them, hold them, direct them to the foot of the cross. Steve talked about it last night. We had a wonderful meeting. And Steve said, man, our whole goal, what was it, Steve? You said it perfectly. Our whole goal with God's children is to point them to the what? the foot of the cross and remind them of who they are. What? I think Marianne said it. Our what? Our identity? Didn't you talk about that? We remind people of their identity in Christ. When we fall, that's not who we are. Who we are is how God sees us. As Colossians says, we are holy and without blame in his eyes. Wow. Wow. No wonder he was riding a beast of burden. He was saying, this is the victory. This is true victory. 
victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Do we have the victory right now? We're not waiting for it. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. We're always victorious. We're not waiting for the victory. That is how the victory is won. Jesus bore our burdens, and we show that and prove that victory by bearing one another's burdens. We are each other's beast of burden. So now, think twice when you call someone an ass. <laughs> right? Amen. It's so weird. That covenant community church, they all call each other asses. <laughs> That's the nicest thing, man. I bear my burdens of my brothers and sisters. I bear their burdens. Because, man, they fall on their face all the time. Why don't you come and be an ass with us? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, you out there in the internet. I might need to edit that sucker. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, a bunch of asses at that. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and upon the colt, the bowl of an ass, and I will cut off, not 2,000 years later, he already did this. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. He destroyed Israel, he destroyed Jerusalem. Why? The Bible says, last of all, he sent his son and they killed him. And, he, and Jesus asked the Pharisees, what do you suppose he will do to those wicked husbandmen? They said he will miserably destroy them. And he did. He destroyed the Jews. He destroyed Jerusalem because they crucified him. And they trusted in their self-righteousness. And the same thing happens with people today when they're not trusting in Christ, but trusting in their works and their self-righteousness and they worship themselves. They perish. They don't get everlasting life. It's a tragedy. And we're constantly about the business of telling people, you can't save yourself. Only Jesus can. Amen? Amen. He's our sovereign savior. And we demonstrate that sovereign salvation by loving one another. He says, and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the heathen. Has he done it? That's us. Amen. That's us. <laughs> right? That's us. And his dominion shall be from sea to sea. Yep. That's happened now. We see Christ and the gospel going throughout all the world and convicting hearts to trust in him and to experience his love. And from the river, even to the ends of the earth. And they said to him, just more of this issue of Jesus being king. For thus it is written in the prophet, and you Bethlehem, right? That's the story. Land of Judah are not least among the princes. For out of you shall come a what? Governor. And I'm not talking Gavin Newsom. <laughs> I, I, I can't even believe I don't even want to go back to California. I don't even want to go there. Because what he does is he exemplifies bondage. He exemplifies it. He says, you're in bondage. And that is such a wonderful type of what being in sin is. Not believing in Christ. Jesus says, if the Son therefore shall set you free, you shall be free. Indeed, Indeed we are set free. We're slaves to righteousness. His righteousness, not ours. All right. How about this one? I love this one. Jesus is in this little dialogue. He's about to be crucified. And he's, and he's talking with Pilate. And it's kind of a philosophical discussion, right? They're waxing a little intelligent. Pilate said to him, are you a king? <laughs> Come in riding upon an ass. Jesus said, you say that I am king. For this purpose, I was born. Amen. Now imagine if he said, well, for this purpose, I was born. But y'all are going to reject me and I have to go to a different plan. So I won't be king for another 2,000 years. No. Silly goose. That's not what he said. He said, for this purpose I was born. And for this cause I came into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. You know what the next word of Pilate was? He said, what is truth? 
If your kingdom is not of this world, and it's all about this unseen thing, what is truth? I'm under the dominion of Caesar. Right? What was Jesus saying? He's saying, Caesar's your king. I'm my people's king. These all do contrary to the laws of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Now watch this. Next one. That could have said then. Right? Get it? In other words, Paul could have said, well, he's not king yet. Instead, he says, now, unto the king eternal. Is Christ eternal? Absolutely. Unto the king immortal. Is Christ immortal? Amen. Unto the king invisible. Ooh, that's a hard one. Is Christ invisible? Absolutely. He dwells in our hearts, people. You have Jesus in you. You have Jesus, God, the creator of heaven and earth, dwelling in you. Merry Christmas. What a gift. You know? The only wise God. Be honor. That's Jesus. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, read it with me. Joy to the world. The Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Well, watch this. I'm going to read a couple of passages. And we're going to get through this. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. By the way, how many of you have ever read Psalms? Any? Some Psalms, maybe one or two. Whenever you read a Psalm, listen. Whenever you read a Psalm that speaks of singing a new song, it's speaking about the new covenant and joy of being in Christ Jesus. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all you earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. That's what we're going to do tonight, folks. Seriously, invite your friends. Invite people to come tonight. And when you invite them saying, guess what we're all going to do? We're actually going to think about the words. What? <laughs> Who the funk? <laughs> right? Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. That's Jesus. Jesus is our salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen. That's what we do. We talk about the glory of Jesus. We don't talk about our glory, our self-righteousness, our works, our good deeds. Oh, I'm such a good guy. I gave this much, you know, in the offering plate. I go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. Go to prayer group. No, we declare his works. His glory, his wonders. How about this one? So later on in the passage, watch. Are you ready? About these rocks and hills. You know, have anyone ever sung the song? All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Trees up. Anyone sing that? Okay. Now, if you're like me, I'm kind of a dunce. I'm just going to be honest. I, like, give me the hat. Put me in the corner. <laughs> I'm used to it. I, they did that in school. Anyway. I used to sit there and picture all these trees, right? I mean, come on. You know, like this willow. Oh, right? What does that look like? I kept trying to visualize this. I'd read this because I was one of these people that was like, the Bible's literal. I've got to take it every word literally, right? What does that mean? Trees of the field. Imagine oaks clapping their hands. Doesn't it have something deeper and richer and more meaningful? Let's see. Say among the heathen, the Lord reigns. That's what we tell people. We don't tell people we're waiting for Jesus to reign. The world shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. That's what he's done to us. He's judged us in Christ. And he's judged us in righteousness. And he's declared you righteous by his cross. Let the heavens rejoice. That's us. We're the heavens. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea and by the way, if you look at the word see, we talked about it before, see in Old Testament prophetic context is referring to you and me, the Gentiles. Let the sea roar. So many of us Christians, we don't even talk about Jesus. Okay? I, I battle with it. I get ashamed. I do. I get, I get scared of people. I get scared to talk to people about Jesus. It's easy with you guys because you guys are sitting there going, yeah, Merry Christmas, <laughs> Right? But man, we're living in an age. And I talk to you people, middle schoolers, high schoolers, college age students. 
You're at the toughest time in your life. This is the watershed moment for all y'all. It's the watershed moment. Because I'm telling you, your universities, your professors, your employers, they're going to tell you that Jesus is a myth. They're going to tell you that being a believer in Christ is anti-intellectual. They're going to tell you that there's nothing in Jesus, that all this stuff is a hoax. Let the sea roar. Declare his glory. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of your king and your God. You're going to fall down many times and they'll see it. And they'll say, well, how can you call yourself a Christian if you did that? I saw you at the bar. And you're going to say, you know what? I'm working on it. But in God's eyes, he's forgiven me. He loves me. Don't be afraid. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful. We are God's field and all that is therein. For all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. Your trees. He comes, he comes to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. That's what he's done. This is the gospel of Christ. Psalm 18, the sorrows of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. They did that to Jesus. They did it to his prophets. They're going to do it to you. But he says, fear not for I have what? Overcome. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, be like a, a, a black congregation. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. I mean, this stuff is glorious. You know, that's why we come here. We, we get renewed. We get, we get like uh, gassed up because then tomorrow's Monday, right? As I wake up, oh, I was happy yesterday, <laughs> right? No, I'm with y'all. I experience it. Psalm 1. This is another thing you go to people. I'm a tree. They think they're trees. They're asses and trees. <laughs> and he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither. Isn't that great? That's pointing us to Revelation 22. Jesus is our living waters. He's the tree of life planted in the middle of that river. And we are the trees on either side of the river. This is us. Whatever we do prospers, Jeremiah 17, 8. He shall be a tree by the waters that spreads out our roots by the river. That's us. Let's go into Isaiah 61. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. We sing the song. The oil of joy for mourning. That's what we have. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. What are you going through? You always go back, Steve, to the foot of the cross. And he replaces that spirit of heaviness with his forgiveness. He reminds you who you are. He reminds you of your identity in Jesus. Why? He says that they might be called, read it with me, trees of righteousness. One translation says, you know what it says there? Oaks. Isn't that beautiful? Oaks. Why no stinking eucalyptus? <laughs> I don't know why I thought of that. That was just weird. I, we're oaks, okay? We're oaks. What does oak symbolize? Strength. You know, it symbolizes strength. The planting of the Lord, you didn't plant yourself. When was the last time you saw a tree plant itself? Eh, right? You never saw that. God did it. He said, I'm going to plant you and you're planted in his son. That he might be glorified. If I planted myself, I can say, I planted myself. God's like, well, you're a peach tree then. <laughs> right? <laughs> But if I plant you, you're an oak, right? Let's move on. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. That's us. And the trees of the field shall clap their hand. Instead of the thorn, here it is. Remember I talked about the goat head, right? <laughs> the goat head. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, an everlasting sign that shall never be cut off. Glory to God. 
No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. This is fulfilled in us. When you sing joy to the world, this is fulfilled. There are no more thorns. There are no more sorrows. You say, but I cried yesterday. I cried this week. I cry about once a week, at least. Sometimes two times. Sometimes it's for... I mean, I'll cry. I'll cry sometimes over seeing... I almost cried last night watching a video of a dog. Did you get that? Did you get that link I sent? Oh, it's a poor thing. Big old fluffy, cute, hairy dog. It's the most cutest thing. It was the sweet. And so this dog, it was born with something weird that was going on with its legs. And so it was doing this. It can't even walk. Had anyone seen that? It, oh, and I was like... <laughs> you know, looking around, see if anyone can see I'm crying. Anyone cried this week? Anyone? Dudes, dudes. Any dudes cried this week? No, all y'all are tough cowboys. I saw you, Steve. I saw you cry. But you know what? We, we cry with tears of joy, don't we? You ever done that? Tears of joy? When you realize, oh my gosh, how badly I blew it last night and yet I'm forgiven. What's that? Connor. <laughs> I remember back here when he said that I thought you were like him. Yeah, yeah. Me. yeah. Tough me, Steve. This one. No more sorrows. You say, wait a minute. Is that fulfilled? Yes. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows and the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Amen. The sorrow of sin, the thorns of sin, it's been removed. He's taken it away from us. That should remind us of the passage in Genesis. Unto Adam, he said, because you listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. And I believe what he's talking about is the ground of the heart. I'm almost done here. The ground of the heart. That's why Jesus talked about the seed. And some fell on the, the thorny ground. And some fell on the rocky ground. And some fell by the wayside. But then others fell upon the good ground. He talked about the ground. The ground is the heart here. He's removed that curse. He made our ground good. In sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. That was the old covenant period. Sorrow and darkness and blackness and tempest. Read it. Hebrews 12. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you and you shall eat the herb of the field. That's all just language speaking about what sin did under the old covenant. But watch what Hebrew says. The earth which drinks in the rain that comes off and upon it brings forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed. In other words, all God is saying is, look, when I'm planting it, it grows and it's great. It's wonderful. The Bible calls us a water garden of the Lord. He says, but that which bears thorns and briars, that's self-righteousness, is rejected and is near unto cursing. We have no more curse. And then finally, let's read it together. He rules the world with what? Truth and grace. And makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. Isn't that beautiful? And I'm going to read you this last passage together and show that this is all fulfilled. Joy to the world. That beautiful, that beautiful hymn, Isaac Watts, is now fulfilled because of Christ. And the word was made flesh. That's Jesus. Logos. Greek word logos, where we get the word logic. God is logic. God is logic. The universe is ordered by him. Two plus two will never equal five because God ordered it to be four. You will never be forsaken by God because God cannot lie and he will not break his promise to you. That is a law of God, word, logic, logos, okay? He will never forsake you. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Just read that with me. We're almost done here. Full of grace and truth. And I want to tell you that we now are full of grace and truth. Are you ready? Watch. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that comes after me is preferred before me. He said, I'm not even worthy to loosen his sandals, right? He says, he was before me. And of his what? Fullness. Fullness have we all received? What fullness? 
full. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And he's saying, and of his fullness have we all received. Hallelujah. That's us. Hallelujah. And grace for grace. Unmerited favor. We didn't deserve it. He just gave it to us because he loved us. Right? And wonders of his love. And the law, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. God bless you guys. Merry Christmas.